Okay, hello everybody. So for today we have Patricia Sellers. Now Ms. Sellers has prosecuted war crimes of sexual violence in Rwanda and Yugoslavia. And she's developed legal strategies for the interpretations of these crimes in international criminal law. But she's also a core figure of the um, international legal academic sphere as well, as well. So she's done research with LSE and she is a practicing lecturer at LSE as well and at Oxford University and a research fellow at UC Berkeley. She also consults governments and international organizations on sexual violence, enslavement, and international criminal law. And with that, let's please welcome Ms. Sellers to the stage. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sellers. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Ms. Sellers, so yeah. you've had an incredibly impressive career um, and you have been a part of the most important cases in recent history, I think, in international law. Uh, could you tell us a bit about what you're working on right now? Okay, what I'm working on right now is something that I am absolutely, utterly, compellingly thrilled about. <laughs> and uh, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court 18 months ago asked me would I be one of the special advisors at large on any subject. And so I retorted to him, why don't you make me special advisor for slavery crimes? Mm -hmm. So the first time at any international court or tribunal, there's a special advisor for crimes of enslavement under international criminal law. And last month, the prosecutor has moved forward to ask me to develop a slavery crimes policy that the office will be working on for the next year, and we hope within 18 months that we can launch it. So that's wow. what I'm currently Incredible. working on. Well, and super. what made you say yes to that? What made you feel compelled to, to Well, I think that? since I'm the one who suggested that he appoint an advisor of slavery crimes, mm. I had a slight inkling that I'd better say yes to the second question. Okay. Uh, among the reasons that I'm excited to say yes, it means that we're going to be able to look at child soldiers and understand that these are enslaved children, that we can finally look at some migrants that go through possibly Libya or other places in the world and understand that these are not in that common knowledge or language of trafficked people. These are slave traded and enslaved people via smugglers to get to new areas. We'll be able to now understand that when we use terminology of uh, bushwives, that we're talking about enslaved females. Yeah. And forced pregnancies is just a manifestation of enslavement. So having been a descendant of a slave, for me, what a, what a better assignment mm -hmm. to have. Fascinating. And so would you say that that is your expertise in international law or your expertise in your field at the moment? Yeah, I would qualify at the moment because in okay. some ways uh, that brings in everything that has to do with the gendered nature of the enslaved mm. person. So it, it encompasses all types of sexual violence. It yeah. encompasses all types of uh, gender and sexual orientation violence. Yeah. Uh, it has to come under the categories of war crimes, so you have to be an expert in that crimes against humanity, and certainly we could see with um, the Yazidis who were um, in between Iraq and Syria that their genocide was accompanied by a crime against humanity of enslavement. So you have to understand genocide to understand how to distinguish the evidence of enslavement and the evidence of genocide that are, con that are occurring simultaneously. Yeah. Do you think your career led you to this? Do you think it was a step-by-step -step, uh progress? When I look backwards, I say yes. When I was going through it day by day, I wouldn't have said, oh, this yeah. is leading me to that. But I look back at one of the cases that we did in Yugoslavia, uh, the Kunarats case, which is the Foccia case, and I realized that I had, at that time period, pushed the investigators and the prosecutors that in addition to charging rape as a crime against humanity and categorizing that rape as a form of torture, that what had happened to those girls and women, because they spanned it between 12 and about 26, was something more. That those women had been 
placed in different private homes of soldiers and basically were now enslaved females. And so by trying to bring this charge for the first time way back in 1998, it was um, in some ways horribly misunderstood because in our minds, slavery meant going out into the field picking cotton or something of that nature. But to understand that the enslavement of these females occurred during military operations, occurred when they were passed from house to house. So I didn't realize then that in essence that was a big first step to the policies of today. And what made you realize that? Was, there, was it seeing those particular cases in Yugoslavia? I think the, the quick answer is yes, okay. looking at the facts there. Uh, you, you had an under, if you understood international criminal law, and you understood the, the crimes under Crimes Against Humanity that we could use, uh, there was a lot of encouragement, and particularly from the feminist community, make sure we use rape as a war crime. And that happened um, with the Celebici case. And then rape is uh, outrageous on personal dignity as a war crime, that happened with Forensia. And then in one of the Rwanda cases, Akiesu, it was the first time they used rape as a crime against humanity. So by the time this Focha Kunrat case is up, uh, it was understood we can certainly use rape as a crime against humanity. And that the sexual violence, the rape that occurred to these women uh, was done for a purpose. Yeah. And so therefore you could use torture because torture under customary law is the intentional infliction of severe mental or physical pain on someone. And certainly when you've been raped eight or nine times every day for, let's say, months and months, you could make an argument that that's the intentional infliction of severe mental pain or suffering. Yeah. But for what reason? For confession, uh, for punishment, uh, or based on gender. So we had that secured. But then just looking at the facts, I think we started with over 50 women who had been sexually violated and finally, the soldiers decided to take about seven or eight females. And I keep saying females because some of these females were not women, they were girls. And decided to station them at different houses. And as they were stationed at these houses, it was so that soldiers returning from the front line could come in and, and rape them. And then a couple soldiers decided, well, they're my girls. I'm going to even pretend to make them walk around the village as if they were my girlfriend. They'll have to get on top of the table completely naked and dance for me and my friends. And then you understand that the definition of enslavement under international criminal law is when you exercise um, all the powers, all or any of the powers, I'm sorry, attaching to the rights of ownership. So these females literally became owned not necessarily legally de jour, that it wasn't a paper and entitlement, but they were owned de facto. They had to do whatever they were told to do. The person controlled sexual access to them, controlled whether they ate, controlled whether they could put clothes on that day, uh, controlled them psychologically, and even I think what convinced my colleagues that we could charge enslavement for the first time is that they were finally traded for a TV set, and another group was traded for 500 Deutsche Marks. And when you look at those, you say, well, yeah, I agree rape is going on, I agree torture is going on, but something else is going on. I'm now looking at enslaved females. And therefore, we were able to bring the, the charge under the Kunarad's case, and the trial chamber agreed with the evidence that these women had powers of ownership exercised over them continually, the smaller contingent. And then uh, the appeals chamber confirmed uh, that conviction by the trial chamber. So this is how it started. It was the facts that led you to the charge. But sexual violence has only been criminalized 30 years ago. Um, why? Why did it take so long for well, it to be? Well, that's not true. It's been criminalized, let me see, what year are we in? Well, it's been criminalized for over 2,000 years. Okay, I, and I think there's a difference between something being criminalized and that criminality being enforced. You know, so like, you might be able 
you might say you can't park your car in the middle of the street, but if people park their car in the middle of the street and no one ever gives you a ticket, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that there's no crime of not parking your car. It means that no one's going to enforce the crime. And so I, you know, when you go back um, to almost any civilization, uh, Japanese civilization, the civilization of Mesopotamia, there were always rules for how you waged a war. I think since the first cavemen started throwing sticks at each other, they started saying, hold up, let's get some rules going here, okay? Can't throw a stick that's bigger than eight feet long. You know, can't throw a stick when I'm laying down. There are always rules of war. And we can really go back literally 2,000 years and show that there were rules where you were not supposed to uh, pick the fruit of a flowering tree or abuse certain categories of people, not individuals. We didn't have individual human rights. Uh, but one of my favorite uh, treaties, as a matter of fact, is the treaty that the Dutch signed with the newest republic, the United States, in 1776. And it's called a Treaty of Friendship. And in this Treaty of Friendship, a completely commercial treaty, as, as the Dutch would want to have commercial treaties because they were a ship-going nation. Well, in this treaty, it says, in case of war, our ships can return to the harbor safely and that you will not abuse or violate, which is code word for sexual abuse, scholars, that means all of you sitting here weren't supposed to get raped, uh, agricultural people, uh, women and children, and the clergy, because that part of the society was not supposed to be touched by war. War was between soldiers, and this part of the society was to continue to gallop so that whoever wins the war gets to take over all the people. So it's very nice to know that sexual violence has been outlawed for hundreds and thousands of years against us. It's just that its enforcement has been more recent. But I, I will even pull you back further than 30 years because um, during the US Civil War, there's been codes and violations, but in particularly during World War II, there's a huge myth that the Nuremberg Judgment didn't cover sexual violence. Internationally. Internationally, but it did. <laughs> uh, the Nuremberg Judgment does not contain the word rape in the judgment. Yeah. But if you understand the basis of the law that the judges are using, and if you, you know, for your nighttime reading, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise it, but if you'd go back and read all the testimony and the transcripts of Nuremberg, you will find that on the record are the rapes that come from Clermont-Fort and occupied France. Uh, there's male sexual violence on the testimony records, talking about prisoners of war, uh, male prisoners of war, that they would throw iron balls against their genitals. Uh, there's that's evidence... Humiliation. Yes, ev that's torture. There's evidence on the record of, um, uh, on the Russian front, uh, women and girls that were placed in brothels for soldiers. So that's where you get the war crime enforced prostitution. And there were convictions based upon these acts. But um, the judgment from World War II that is overlooked but contains explicit sexual violence is the Tokyo judgment, but no one runs to it. And so I tell all of my students, well, if you, if you read chapter eight of the Tokyo Judgment, within the first paragraph, they talk about rapes. And then they list them throughout, but they also list castration of boys and men. Uh, they list the cutting off of breasts. Uh, they list, literally, the rape of Nanking is not figurative, it's factual. Yep. So sexual violence has been outlawed for a very long time. And what we're really looking at are the mechanisms and the follow-through to enforce those laws. But they did happen before 30 years ago. And has that recognition reduced the frequency of these crimes at all? Or, yeah, has it reduced the... Well, Ben, I would like to think so, okay? <laughs> okay. It's your job. But I don't know. Yeah. And I think yeah. the reason we don't know is it is near impossible to really quantify how much sexual violence occurs. Um, among the reasons, for example, you have the genocide against the Tutsis in Rwanda, yeah. and there are estimates that in between 500,000 and 800,000 people were killed. And it seems fairly 
common that a percentage of the females who were killed were raped before they were killed. And so we might be counting deaths and therefore not counting the sexual violence that occurred. So it's very difficult to get great statistics on sexual violence. Um, it's difficult to get them in terms of females. It's almost impossible to get them in terms of males. Males have, in my professional opinion, a much harder time coming forward and saying that they've been sexually violated during war or crimes against humanity. Compared to the females, uh, the females are running forward and the men are walking backwards. Do you think it's because of the humiliation factor? Oh, I think it's, it's because of yeah, gender dynamics. You know, men, men are loath to see themselves at war as being sexually vulnerable, period. Uh, most men who will talk about sexual vulnerability at war will say, I've been tortured, even though there might have been a type of, you know, insertion into um, their anus cavity. Uh, or men will not recognize, and this sounds strange, they won't recognize when they're being sexually violated. Why do you think that is? Well, I think men have a hard time talking about sexual violence because they think it feminizes them or it makes them homosexual. So you've got all of these gender dynamics running around. Another thing is that society has a very difficult time of holding this conversation so that men can have a space to have the conversation. Now, I'll tell you two, I think two of the most common types of male sexual violence that I've seen over the past 30 years. Uh, one is, uh, and, and this we found in Yugoslavia, but I think it also occurs in, um, in Syria, that a lot of male sexual violence occurs in detention centers. In the Yugoslav context, uh, males would be sexually violated in detention centers, but in, under very specific situations that differed from women. Men were usually mm, sexually violated by asking two prisoners to come up in front of all the other male prisoners and making those two prisoners either commit fellatio, sucking each other's penis, or one would have to insert the penis in the anus. And the reason that the scenario was set like that was so that all of the other male prisoners could look at it, right? And often they would have the two people at the front, the two males at the front, be related somewhere, father, son, or corporal, private, have a military relationship or a family relationship or something, because that added the horror yeah. to the sexual violence. But my point is this, I agree that that's sexual violence, but every male that had to watch that sexual violence was psychologically sexually violated. And those males often don't see themselves as having survived a sexual violence. It was a psychological sexual violence. Yeah. So many men in detention today in Syria, before Yugoslavia, now have a bit more language to understand my sexual violation was psychological. I was forced to watch this and I knew these people and, and I felt vulnerable, I was vulnerable, I was victimized. We're just beginning to have that language. And then the other form of male sexual violence that's very common that we don't talk about is that often when males are uh, held in detention centers or held during armed conflict, that they're, that they're beaten, you know, they're beaten with batons. So what position do you think most males retreat to when they're beaten? The fetal position. Yeah. But why do you go in a fetal position? Why do you go in the fetal position? You're covering because your genitals. You're covering your, yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah. what do you think that much of the beating is aimed at? Submission? At the genitals of the males, yeah. and that's sexual violence. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I'm just saying those two examples. Yes, it's submission, it's humiliation, it's defeat. But um, the point I'm trying to underscore is that a lot of male sexual violence is not spoken about because it's not recognized even by that male as sexual violence. And it's rarely um, quantified, it's rarely counted. You know, we'll maybe count the rapes, but we won't count the beatings on the genitalia. You know, we won't count how many men were forced to watch other men. So in a criminal court, how do you then define sexual violence in order for it to be tried? Well, under the Rome Statute, there is mm -hmm. a, 
a crime called sexual violence, and it has its specific elements. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, it, it talks about uh, someone either being forced to do a sexual uh, act, participate, um, and the thing is that conduct, that act, or that omission could be filled up by a large number of different types of details. You know, I mean, I'll ask you this. If you were a woman and the enemy was allowed to check your menstruation cycles by looking at your underwear every month, would you consider yourself sexually violated or not? No, of course. Of course. She, she, yeah. she said, of course. What do you think? Well, so the crime of sexual violence might encapsulate that. Or it could encapsulate uh, someone mutilating your breasts. So what I'm saying is that there's a wide berth of conduct that might fulfill the sexual violence. But it would have to be presented um, yeah. in court, usually by, through the testimony of a witness. It would have to show that the perpetrator knowingly, intentionally um, committed this act or caused this act to be committed and that you were the victim survivor and that it occurred within the context of either an armed conflict, therefore mm. it might be a war crime, or while there was an attack against the civilian population and therefore it, it could amount to one act in a crime against humanity. Because cases are quite rarely actually brought to trial. That's why I'm asking about this. It's, there are so few cases, maybe more so now, but it took a long time to get to this point. And so how is the process of getting a case of sexual violence uh, to a courtroom, uh, why, 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 why doesn't it work so well to actually succeed in getting justice? So I think you're asking why are there so few cases of sexual yeah. violence mm -hmm. that result in a court case and then even fewer that result in a conviction? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think when you look at d domestic crimes, I mean, just here in, in Holland, where I live in Belgium, just here in Belgium, what is the percentage of cases of sexual violence, and let's just say heteronormative rape, what are the percentage of cases that get to the police station, get to investigation, get to court, get to conviction? I mean, statistics or estimates are what? But would you blame the system for this, or would you well, say that let it's... me answer your first question first. <laughs> 8%, 9%, 3%, 2% of those who recognize it. Okay, yeah. And when you look at that in the context of war crimes, genocide, or crimes against humanity, uh, you're looking at situations that can be even much more difficult to find witnesses who want to come forward, you know, go to the police station, and take your testimony, to find witnesses who will maintain the good evidence for eight, nine, ten years mm -hmm. while they're being a refugee, while their house maybe has been burned down, and maybe for them on that very day, the sexual violence wasn't the most important thing. What was more important was that their son was killed or that their, their mother or their grandparents uh, went missing. And even though the sexual violence was extremely important, it might have been relative to the other horrors going on. So that person has to remain a witness for you know, five to 10 years mm. and then either come to The Hague or you know, be interviewed uh, via video camera. And for some people, they're not confronting their actual perpetrator. Who they're confronting is the commanding officer of the perpetrator or the president of the country. And so while they might be more interested in person A, the court has brought person B who's responsible for all the crimes and then to understand that. And so by the time you get to a conviction, you do have a reduced number. I agree with you. You have a reduced number in terms of the deaths, in terms of the rapes, in terms of the burning. But I think what you're trying to say is, why hasn't society been more proactive? Why haven't we had more persons have their sexual violence redressed? Mm. Yeah. Well, I think we have to make it a, a priority. I mean, on the one hand, this is, these are horrible things. No one would want it to happen to you or anyone you know, and yet we know it happens. It's, happen it's happening today in Congo, yeah. Yeah. over and over and over. Um, and, and then we'll hear discussions of, you know, international justice is too expensive. Well, wh what's the cost of Nuremberg? What would you pay for Nuremberg today? 
you know, what's the cost of Tokyo? <laughs> Shall we put money there or what's the cost of war? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there are all these, you know, trade-offs, but they're basically sometimes trade-offs of, of values that we vocalize that we want to have cases and people, in quotes, brought to justice. Yeah. But we want it to be quick, cheap, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm done. And it seems like what you're addressing here is also a political motivation. So do you, do you get the sense that these political motivations can be changed? Oh, I think so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think they think should so. be. <laughs> I think they should be. And how do you think they should be changed? Well, I, I think political motivations come about being changed in, in some ways by going from the margins and then seeing actions. I think 30 years ago, and you were mentioning that term, um, that there might have been a shrug, you know, hmm. rape happens at war, yeah, I'm sorry, what do you want me to do about it? Today, no politician would shrug. They would say, well, I have to get more investigators, or they would you know, figure out some way to make it look like I'm all for the um, investigation or adjudication, but I'm being hindered by certain things. So there, there has been a shift, a watershed, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't think today that um, anyone would ever shrug if another genocide occurred and say, you know, life is life, ethnic groups are ethnic groups. <laughs> there has been a shift. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, that's, it's not just politically incorrect to say that, it's inhumane to say that, okay? So the question is, do these shifts, these political shifts that have to happen among a populace meaning ourselves, is that the same thing as prompting us to, to do something in terms of institutions, uh, in terms of uh, students who become lawyers and can practice in this field, in terms of politicians who understand that my priority will be to redress this as far as deterrence? Well, well going on the issue of shrugging conflicts away as an inevitable part of the world or something just that is accepted. Um, it seems like there are cases, and I think this is a case of internalized racism, mm -hmm. where certain areas of the West just take conflicts in the Middle East or Sub-Saharan Africa as a given. So how do you see those dynamics as playing a role in some of the convictions in the International Criminal Court? Well, on the one hand, the International Criminal Court has been criticized for emphasizing cases that come out of Africa and saying that, uh, that that's part of coloniality and that's part of legal neocolonialism. Now, we can, we can have a big discussion on legal neocolonialism because that's why I'm writing this slavery policy, okay? So if we <laughs> want to go there, we can shift there anytime. But at the same time, and it's not necessarily on the other hand, when you look at um, the continent of Africa, and you look at the way that the continent of Africa in some ways has adhered to the international criminal law, rule of law, in some ways much more so than Western countries. So what am I talking about? I'm referring to that there's a greater percentage of African countries that belong to the Assembly of State Parties of the International Criminal Court than we might find in North America, okay? Uh, that within Africa, because there has been the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda that was held in Arusha, and there has been the Special Court for Sierra Leone that was um, held in Sierra Leone. I have more African colleagues conversant in international criminal law than I do in the United States, okay? The most prolific jurisprudence on genocide comes out of the Rwanda Tribunal. Uh, when I'm lecturing in the United States, I might have a couple of law students who might have heard of that. I have bar associations and, how can I say, a much deeper pocket of students interested in that on the African continent. And now what I want to say is that when the International Criminal Court was set up, among the first perpetrators who came were perpetrators that the African states who belonged to the International Criminal Court handed up to the court. So Uganda, you know, handed up uh, when, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo handed up 
Lubanga. So if some of those cases that, in quotes, focused on Africa are there, it's because the African countries handed these perpetrators and said, would you try them? We're not. There are other cases, you know, from, um, uh, from uh, Guinea and from Kenya that were not handed up. And it's from these cases where extremely high-level politicians were the alleged perpetrators that part of the campaign was, look at this colonial court going after Africans, as opposed to look at this court that at times Africa chooses to use to prosecute some of its perpetrators. But I would say that if um, International Criminal Court went after high level political perpetrators in any continent, there'd be a pushback. I think if you notice former President Trump from the United States uh, was not placed before the court and there was a huge pushback and freezing of assets and everything. So I think some of that is, is politics. Um, we'll take a moment now to maybe get some questions from the audience. Uh, so if you have a question to Ms. Sellers, please raise your hand and Tara will come to you with the mic. Maybe the lady in red here in the... Go on. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you talk. Oh, that's very loud. <laughs> if you talk about enslavement out of a war context, so in peacetime, both sexual enslavement and work for enslavement, is uh, how far can uh, this be brought? In how far can this be brought to the international criminal uh, court? For instance, there are countries in Africa where it happens in the Middle East, uh, in Asia. You might count the Uyghurs in China. And for most of it, it is quite a huge blank field that we have no knowledge of. Uh, it is directed at a group of a population. You would have to, uh, would you have to have the criterion either because of ethnicity or national uh, mm. uh, nationality, religion, uh, race, or uh, gender, or is it possible to? make it a court case because of the scale in which it happened. Right. Well, to try and answer as clear as possible, the only time that an armed conflict is involved with slavery or the slave trade, and those are two crimes that are not under the Rome statute at this point in time. Um, there have been some assembly state parties who are going to propose to make those war crimes. They're war crimes under customary law. So right now, enslavement under the Rome Statute occurs only under crimes against humanity. And how enslavement is structured is that you do not need a war nexus. So you don't have to have an armed conflict to have a charge of enslavement. What you do have to have is what's called the contextual or jurisdictional elements of a crime against humanity. And what are they? you have to have a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. So therefore, yes, you can have enslavement without a war within the context of a crime against humanity, and it has no qualification that it has to be against an ethnic group, against a gender. It's not, I, there you're confusing the crime of persecution with the crime of enslavement, although I would say that anyone who's being enslaved is also being persecuted. But for enslavement, let's say in the non-armed conflict situation, I think that you can um, j just look at what's happening to migrants going through Libya from Eritrea, who at times are detained by so-called smugglers to the extent that those smugglers are now exercising powers of ownership over them. Some are being sold at slave markets in, in Libya. Uh, some are being horrifically sexually violated. Uh, some are being killed, held for ransom. And then they're moved to the next smuggler. But if you look at that same factual pattern and you look at these migrants, males and females, as basically of being enslaved people being slave traded to subsequent smugglers until they reach the coast. And that might be coinciding with militias, Libyan militias fighting each other, but not necessarily considered to be 
a war crime. The crime against humanity is that there's been an attack against the civilian population of migrants. So one could see it from that point of view. Uh, one could also see possibly what you would call huge trafficking networks for forms of sexual slavery. And if one stepped back, you could say that under international criminal law, under the Rome Statute, since trafficking is not a crime under the jurisdiction of the Rome Statute, what I'm really seeing are enslaved, often females, being slave traded from one place to another place and enslaved. And what I'm calling trafficking is really enslavement and slave trading. And then one could say in different factories. So it depends on where the facts are going to take you once we understand what are the legal elements of enslavement. Um, we'll take maybe another question. Uh, the girl in the back in the green sweater, I believe. Hi. Um, thank you for your really, really interesting talk. Um, I had a question on what you were talking about, about male sexual violence um, and the lack of statistics about it and reporting about it. Um, I was wondering, in your experience working with the ad hoc tribunals, whether there was anything about the language of the ACTY or the ICTR statute um, and perhaps the nature of prosecutions, um, the gendered roles that where women are largely seen as victims, men are largely seen as perpetrators, whether that's played any role in your experience in how male sexual violence is recorded, prosecuted, or even convicted in the international sphere? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, uh, because it, the answer is almost the opposite of what one thinks. Uh, what I found rather, um, rather shocking is that at the Yugoslav tribunal, there were over 13 cases of male sexual violence. And these cases were rarely cited, even by feminists. Uh, they were rarely discussed, and so, matter of fact, I decided with a co-author, um, a Nigerian Brit who I had met in one of my trainings, I said, let's write an article just on the male sexual violence. For some reason, no one's reading this. For some reason, no one's putting this together from a legal framework or from a survivor framework. And the question is, is why? And I think that it's still, well, certainly at that time, it's still so taboo to talk about male sexual violence that even the lawyers kind of look at it, pick up a case and drop it. So let me, let me just give you a quick example of how you really had to shut your eyes not to look at it. The first case that ever came out of the Yugoslav tribunal was a case um, where the perpetrator's name was Tadic. He was convicted. The Tadic case centered male sexual violence. It happened at the Omarska prison. Uh, there was supposed to have been also um, evidence of, of female rape, but the female did not come to testify. So who came to testify were the males. And this case had the horrendous facts, took place in a detention center, as I said, took place when the guards, and Mr. Tadic wasn't a guard, but he was pretending he was a guard's buddy, um, tells two, tells three male prisoners to come down in front of the other prisoners, get in this pit. And two prisoners, two male prisoners, are told to lick the third uh, male prisoner's behind and his penis, and then one prisoner is told to bite the testicle off of the prisoner, and that they would not be released until the testicle was in his mouth and he spit it out. I mean, you, you can't get any more compelling facts than that. That's the first, that's the first case in Yugoslav tribunal. But what you'll see taught about that case is often the appellate jurisprudence in terms of uh, uh, whether the court should have had jurisdiction over Mr. Tadic, or we'll talk about detention. And there is something that is making, uh, I will say, the general population and people not want to look at these horrendous facts where male sexual violence is up first. The second case, Yugoslav, had male sexual violence. Horrendous facts of putting hot wires around male penises. And no one wanted to talk about it. The third case had male sexual violence, forcing men to look at a female that they knew being raped by a militia. And so I think that there's still something taboo that we carry around, um, the state carries around, um, the legal community carries around 
that we're not at that point of being comfortable enough to say, this is criminal, this needs redress, that the male sexual autonomy and dignity um, has been violated. What do you think? What do you think would be needed to 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 improve on this? Um, well, I think when I do I do a lot of training of investigators and of prosecutors, and it, it takes time to have people first of all get used to me saying these words. I mean, some of the words I've said today, and then I've got this really wonderful tool by um, a Colombian artist called Botero. Yeah. And Botero did a series of paintings of Abu Ghraib. Yeah. And so I don't want to show, in quotes, uh, pictures of real victims. That could be a form of exploitation. But he's done uh, 10 paintings of different forms of male sexual violence in prison. And so I use those when I'm training. So usually by the end of the training, somewhere we've made a space in our head to say that the subject is valid and to start going to the words that we have to use. And within his, his um, visual display, he shows how we can confront uh, male sexuality, homosexuality, fears of homosexuality, and how all of that is tied up in sexual violence as it pertains to men, making men wear female undergarments, or making um, uh, males insert you know, their penis. So we, we've got to start finding a language, loosen our tongue, you know, make our mind not so stiff, and then we can get to it. But we won't get to it as long as we keep blocking it and say, oh, those poor men, they've got to break the silence. It's hard to come forward. I think it's hard for us to break our silence about it. So I thank you for the question. Thank you, everybody, for those lovely questions. Um, but on that topic of euphemisms and how they can conceal this nature of sexual violence and slavery. Why do you think those terms are used if they detach people from the atrocities or the horror of these atrocities? I think they give us a bit of psychological reprieve. You know, so we have words like comfort women. Yeah. There was the, the discomforted women. I mean, do we want to switch it to that? And these were you know, women, girls and uh, women who were made to sexually serve the Japanese troops, even when we use the term of bushwives. Do you mean that enslaved woman who is sexually enslaved? Why do, why do we call them a, a bushwife? Or we say, you know, the conduct of forced marriage. Mm. I mean, is, is that a marriage? No. No, it's, a, it's a, usually a, a situation of extreme sexual violence, psychological violence, or enslavement. Enslavement. But we're yeah. protecting ourselves with these little phrases, you know? Yeah. Do you think the presence of, of women, I'm guessing it's increased in the past 50 years in, uh, in, inter in international law, has improved the persecution, the prosecution of sexual violence? Yes. And uh, that includes, that includes um, female judges. Mm. Why do you think that is? Well, it's very interesting. Um, a couple months ago, the Ongwen case at the International Criminal Court was conducting the appellate process. And in this appellate process, uh, there were friends of the court briefs that many feminist lawyers decided to submit to the court. And the court invited a certain number of them to come and argue. During these oral arguments, although the, the bench was composed, I think, of, of three women and two men, during the oral arguments concerning sexual violence, only the female judges were asking questions and talking. And I mean, if someone in here is doing anthropology, it would have been an, your anthropological moment of judges. Of why were the females legally more interested in the questions that related to standards for sexual violence. Not that the male judges were not vociferous maybe back in chambers, but it was just very interesting. So I, I do want to say that, yes, female judges, female investigators, maybe female defense attorneys and prosecutors have made a substantial difference. Yeah. But do you think it's disinterest, or do you think that it's just being uncomfortable with the topic? It might be just uncomfort. I wouldn't say disinterest. Um, 
I would, that's why I, would, I think that maybe when they're back in chambers that they're just as you know, vividly involved, uh, they might feel uncomfortable, they might feel that, am I going to phrase this the wrong way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, obviously there was something going on. One yeah. of the cases that I did at the Yugoslav uh, Tribunal, I think that some of the male judges were just as participative as the female judge. Yeah. So it might not be a, you know, a complete rule for all times. And, and do you think that same dynamic applies across race as well? Well, I think in terms of race at the International Criminal Court, that most of the judges who are black are from Africa. As I said, there's a larger percentage of African states who belong to the court. Um, there are Latin American states who belong, but I have not seen any Afro-descendant or indigenous-descended judges at this time at the court. Uh, but I, I do think that among the reasons possibly that questions of enslavement or decoloniality don't come up as often is that when you're with judges who, that is not necessarily how they see the world. That is not how they, they view the world. And your personal life informs, in many ways, your perspective as a judge. And do, this is a very, very sociological answer. And have you seen that in yourself as well, how your personal life or how your own experiences have informed the decisions you've made? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I, you know, I say I'm, allow I'm allowed to bring me to the courtroom. I'm allowed to bring me to my writing. And I, and I tell other um, attorneys, um, you know, and particularly uh, attorneys who might be female or m attorneys who might come from and slash minority groups, you know, bring yourself. I don't see there's anything inadequate that I bring as an African-American black feminist to international criminal law, you know. Yeah. I don't believe that um, the standards that I go by or set are in any way detrimental to international law. As a matter of fact, I think at times I see things that the other criminal lawyers don't see because they're bringing other experiences. Yeah, and yeah. just on that point, what does bringing yourself actually mean? Or to what extent? Well, okay, so let me, let me give you an example. I think that um, the reason, as I've said in the Yugoslav cases, that very few people talk about the male sexual violence, I think people have brought <laughs> to the court, they brought themselves the taboo that they hold on male sexual violence. And I think that's why the silence is there. So you can bring yourself negatively, yeah. you know, or you can bring yourself positively. Um, I remember talking to two investigators at one time who said to me that one of the cases that's occurring now at the court, they came up to me and said, I think that there's a racial element going on. And I said, well, why would they bring that to me? Because yeah. they know I can bring race to the question. If it's there, fine. If it's not there, uh, it's okay. Race could be a qualifier for persecution, as I've stated before. So these two investigators said, um, one came from Africa and one was from the Middle East, they brought their experience and they knew what they were looking at is I think we have hereditary enslavement among our victims. Within this yeah. society, yeah. there's a class of people who have been enslaved for hundreds of years. You can tell by their names, you can tell by their skin color. And so as investigators are saying, I think most of the victims of this perpetrator come from that ethnic group that are hereditary enslaved people. Hmm. Thank goodness they brought themselves, yeah. right? Yeah. Because they saw something that the other investigators, you know, it just went right over them. They, yeah. you know, they couldn't tell the difference. It's like, you know, someone might go to Norway or Finland and not say whether that's a Sami or is that yes. or Norwegian. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, you know, you're supposed to come as people. And I think the real deal is that that's how you can relate to survivors and that's even how you can relate to the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. That these are people and you've yeah. got to be able to understand their motivations, um, what's in their head. But if you only want to bring your reasonable person standard, yeah, it's not going to be a lot of fun. You know. and, and on that note, um, 
speaking about gaining personal experience, I found your s career and how you got there super interesting. And I was wondering if you could maybe tell everyone how you ended up in your line of work. What was your story? Well, I think I always, um, I think I always wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, I really didn't, really didn't like blood, so I didn't want to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. My sister wanted to be a nurse, and um, you know, I was probably influenced a little bit by TV, but also how I grew up at that time period. A lot of the heroes of African American people were lawyers. Uh, yeah. Thurgood Marshall, yeah. yes. you know, uh, there was um, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Exactly. And there was this ideal of engineering, you know, American uh, racial segregation slash apartheid via the law. Yeah. And so I kind of came about, you know, in that way. And I think the other thing is that um, I was more interested in criminal law than any other type of law. I really mm -hmm. didn't, didn't quite understand commercial law. Mm -hmm. Torts was okay. Yeah. Property law was, <laughs> uh, was <so> boring. <laughs> Uh, but criminal law, I got. You know, you were you were speaking to people. You, an act had happened, yeah. and then you have to figure out whether the person was and you uh, worked at guilty a prison, or not. No? And you worked at a prison as well. Well, I worked at uh, right in high school. I worked at a prison. Well, I was in college. I worked at a prison, uh, taking fingerprints, and so got to see inmates. Inmates, but this was before fingerprints were digital, and you just put your hand there before you had your hand had to get really full of that ink yeah. you know, like yeah. that and turn Old it school. and turn it a messy right. job a messy it was a messy <laughs> job right uh, and then after law school I became a public defender it's the only thing I wanted to do um, I didn't want to join a law firm or become a prosecutor prosecutor you had to go to the morgue and look at dead bodies I said I don't want to do that <laughs> but I really enjoyed public defendant work in Philadelphia it was basically an African-American community and a Puerto Rican community so I could use my Spanish and languages and um, I, liked, I liked court, and I had a, a really decent um, high percentage win rate. And then I moved to uh, Latin America, to Brazil. It's the third time I lived in Latin America, doing human rights work. And that really informed a lot of how I understood torture, because Brazil was coming out of the dictatorship at that point in time. Yep. And there were a lot of women's groups, Afro-Brazilian groups, the whole ideal of torture victims, uh, would they get any redress, uh, was very much in the air. So I did that, but then I moved to Europe because my husband's Belgian. I was unemployed for years. I substituted in high school. Mm -hmm. I worked at Price Waterhouse and realized I was a horrible accountant. I mean, just, I'm not numerate at all. And, um, and then I heard from, you know, I think my, husband's cousin, someone was in New York that they might set up this Yugoslav tribunal. And I was like, oh my God, can I, can I please get back into criminal law? And so when that came about, I came to The Hague and talked to the one judge who I assumed had to be black. She was American, and I saw on her CV that she went to Howard University, yeah. which is a traditionally black school. I said, I've never done it in my life. I'm going to make a cold call. I called her up. She was the most generous person, came to Brussels to see me, and I said, can I please be your law clerk? And she says, certainly, but you have to go up to The Hague first, talk to the prosecutors handling all the uh, employment details. And when I met the prosecutor, the deputy prosecutor, he asked me, would you please join my staff instead? And so two job offers after having nothing <laughs> for years. Yeah. Yeah. I said, yes. And then a couple months later, they uh, came to me and said, would you please consider handling the sexual violence uh, portfolio? Because we understand from your background in Brazil, and I'd done rape cases in the States. And so that's how it came about from there on. Incredible. OK, thank you so, so much, Ms. Sellers, for joining us today. This was a fascinating conversation. Thank you to the audience for your questions. If you have any more questions, you can come up to Ms. Sellers after the interview. Uh, and next week, we have Tom Middeldorp, a retired general from the Dutch Army. He has written about the impacts of climate change as a security threat. Uh, so join us next week. It's on the 17th of May. Also, follow us on Instagram, all our social yes, media, TikTok. Um, and you can also sign up to our newsletter. Thank Great. you so much. Thank everybody. you so much.